setting foot in Port-au-Prince is diving headfirst into Haiti's political crisis. The streets barricaded by protesters. It's a commonplace demonstration until the crowd suspects there's a mercenary among them. The demonstrators try to grab his gun from underneath his shirt, but it's too late. The man used to be a bodyguard for the former interior minister. Police officers intercept him and shoot live ammunition to disperse the crowd. We've nearly witnessed a targeted assassination carried out by someone close to the government. For two months, Haiti's experienced relentless protests and road barricades. The rallying cry, President Jovenel Moïse must go. Several times a week, opposition protesters hold spontaneous gatherings. Each time, a musical band kicks off the mobilization, which can often last several hours. It may resemble a carnival parade, but beneath the surface, the anger burns hot. Jovenel has to leave the country. He said he would feed the population, that he would put food on people's plates and some money in our pockets. But ever since he's been in power, he's just been lying to us. Broken campaign promises and a tangle of corruption scandals. A year and a half in, Haiti's protest movement has reached a breaking point. It's a commitment that's paralyzed the country at every level. When it's not monster traffic jams caused by the protests, it's the paylock, which means blocked country in Creole. We left the demonstration to see how the movement's impacting the healthcare system. At this time of day, this room is usually full of people. But unfortunately, as you can see, today there aren't a lot of patients. Not everyone can make it all the way here to get their treatments. Access issues have had dramatic consequences for every department, including pediatrics. The problem is the children arrive a little too late. Yesterday we lost another child, brain hemorrhage. The situation is also concerning for hospital employees. Sometimes children arrive in the middle of the night. The doctor on call needs a specialist, but that specialist can't get here because of the street barricades or because of sporadic shooting at night, so we can't make it on site. Managing inventory is complicated. The hospital director is counting oxygen tanks. Less than a quarter of them are full. If we don't have oxygen, you can imagine a hospital can't function without oxygen. The education system has also stalled. This fall, students never really went back to school. For Marta, going to class has become too risky. Children want to go to school, but demonstrators try to shut the schools down. Kids are getting beat up. If we wear our uniforms, they try to rip them. So principals are asking us to come to school in secret, or else demonstrators might burn the school down. Every institution has been targeted. The result, 250 students at this middle school have left. The school's two principals are disoriented in these deserted halls. Ah. This is going to have a negative impact on these young people's futures. They need to think of the greater interest. They are the future of our country. Back at the protest, the situation's heating up. Protesters are trying to take over the access road leading to the president's residence, some of them carrying batons. The police are overwhelmed. Without warning, they shoot real bullets in the air and disperse the crowd with tear gas. Then a manhunt begins. Undercover, Haitians say they support the movement, despite their fear. Scenes of panic break out. Some protesters stone those who are trying to keep working. Storekeepers and passers-by are distressed. Gas stations try to protect themselves. Dès 
Everywhere, Haitian business is suffering. In a capital city that's practically deserted, we find the most determined protesters. The first injuries happen quickly. At the end of the day, the violence reaches a climax. It's protesters' projectiles against police officers' lethal weapons. According to the UN, 42 people have died in the protests since mid-September, including 19 killed by police. As a relative calm sweeps over the street, Farah slowly leaves her shelter. Another day of protests draws to a close. At the gates of the presidential palace, the barricades are still smoking, and Joven Moïse is still in the seat of power.